Welcome back to another episode of Real with Ryan. This podcast interview is going to be a little bit different. Our friend and guest Patrick Pulliam is turning the table on me and interviewing me instead of the other way around. In today's episode, Pat's going to ask me a handful of questions and I'm going to respond and we get to talking about some of my entrepreneurial backstory, some of the businesses that I ran in college, what I'm doing with my media, some stories about how I try to learn things quickly like golf and also some of the people who have influenced my life. For more content, please check out realwithryan.com or you can follow me on Instagram to get daily updates at I'm.the.ryan. But without further ado, enjoy this episode. Welcome back to a, another Real With Ryan interview. We appreciate you listening. If you have heard this podcast before, you have heard of Patrick Pulliam, uh, who has received several interviews, and and everyone has been loving those interviews with Pat. Uh, Today, we're doing a little bit of a different format, trying out something else. Pat is actually going to be the one shooting questions over to me. So we figured that I have been the one kind of asking lots of questions. We've gotten some great learnings from Pat. Um, but today the tables are turning. So with that, I'm going to toss it right back to you, Pat, and we can kick things off. Awesome. Awesome. Glad to be here, Ryan, and glad to be in the uh, interviewer seat. This is exciting, of course, to uh, get to talk. For those of you who are listening, uh, my name is Patrick Pulliam. I'm a real estate agent, among other things, here in Northwest Arkansas. Ryan is a good friend of mine, and I reached out to see if I could interview him um, because he's so great about um, giving out information and interviewing other people, but this is a good opportunity for him to talk about some of the things he does. So with that being said, Ryan, glad we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I am excited. I, I love answering questions as much as I, I love asking them. So can't we're going to, we're going to see if throughout the thing, Ryan can stay as the interviewee and not try to turn into the interviewer um, <laughs> kind of throughout the combo, but Let's jump into this. So the first thing on the plate, just to give everybody an idea of of, uh, who you are and what you do now, you have done some incredible things online. I was just scrolling through Mm. Instagram, seeing video after video, um, 15,000 views, 40,000 views, uh, tons of likes on social media. And I know that's not Mm. even your biggest platform. So what are you doing on TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, right now? Yeah. Yeah. So... You know, in this current season that I'm in, and and really it started in 2020 during COVID and the pandemic, when we learned that we're going to be home all the time. Um, I have always in the background had this idea of starting YouTube or streaming or just this fascination with media. And I always watch YouTube videos growing up. And so over COVID uh, specifically was kind of the flame that got lit under me to start focusing more on creating media and using social media, my social media accounts to dive more into myself and then spread that with the world. And so I've always had Instagram, Snapchat, uh, you know, you name it. And then um, I started listening to podcasts and really was inspired by listening and the content of podcasts and said, hey, I want to start creating some stuff of my own. And so, you know, halfway through 2020, I'm working from home. I'm home all the time. I found TikTok, honestly. And like many other people, I just happened to stumble across TikTok. I downloaded it and uh, I was just a a user. I I watched endless videos during COVID while I was at home, you know, laughed at all the stuff, you know, and and then, you know, started to dabble a little bit with, man, this is kind of a fun platform. I love videos. Let me just start making a handful of short TikToks. really with no objective other than to just entertain myself um, and create some content. And so I made a whole bunch of goofy TikToks. Um, But then, you know, I I used to be a dog trainer uh, professionally. 
um, I started making some more dog specific TikTok videos, um, tutorials, lessons, and um, you know, I I also uh, have one of my dogs, Ollie, drag me on my skateboard, um, and he pulls me around our block, and it's kind of crazy. Uh, and we were doing that over and over again during quarantine just to get out of the house, get my dog some exercise and have fun. And those videos really started to blow up and get some traction on TikTok. And that little bit of inspiration of, of traction on TikTok and, and the idea that, hey, people are really finding some value in this dog training, dog boarding content. Mm -hmm. I started leaning in more into just the idea of being a content creator and took that from TikTok to YouTube to podcast to Instagram and just kind of, I, I'm not the type of person that can dive fully into one platform and really have a, a pinpoint of focus, but spread that focus across a lot of platforms and ended up creating content in a lot of different categories across a lot of different platforms, mainly just for you know my own entertainment, but also to you know spread some value to the people that listen. So quick so overview of media. Yeah. Why don't you just... Why don't you just break us in here and tell us what your highest viewed video is, and uh, we can all kind of wow at the uh, at the number. Yeah, let me um, take a moment and get the most up to date um, video. It is on TikTok, yeah. um, and actually, it was a, a video I recorded recently, and it was definitely a more just kind of viral, funny type of video that I didn't have expectations with. But there's this sound bite that um, a different content creator had created. Um, and it is this guy who is saying, who wants a totally normal peanut butter cracker? Um, and then he pans over to his dog and the dog says, I do. And he feeds this dog a, a cracker that has peanut butter and a whole bunch of pills on it. Yeah. Well, my dog, Ollie, has epilepsy and takes 14 pills a day. Oh and so I used that sound bite and I put all my dog's pills on a cracker with peanut butter on it, used that sound bite, recorded me giving my dog Ollie his pills. And, you know, it's just like a four or five second long video, but something about the way the video ended up, there was like, there's just like a little bit of like magic to it. So the sound bite plus the video just, it, it hits the it, it hits your nervous system in a way that just is very pleasing. Um, anyways, that has 14 million views, nice. um, some, wow. you know, a few million likes. And for better or for worse, I think there has been several thousand human hours that has been spent watching this Imagine like that. five second video of me giving my dog pills. So that's, that's the most viral one on TikTok. <laughs> So, and it's proof of concept because you've, you've had many videos go what you might call viral and get into the millions mm -hmm. of views or at least hundreds of thousands of views. So, um, I think that a lot of people like that you have a unique take on what to do with dogs. And then mm -hmm. beyond that kind of enjoy just doing funny stuff with them. So what percentage, you don't have to give me real numbers, but I mean, mm -hmm. how many of those are just kind of viral content stuff versus actual educational pieces? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a good mix of content that I try to create and, you know, I break content into a few different categories. Um, so one, I've got ideas and kind of my intellectual curiosities. So business ideas interviews with people like yourself, um, fleshing out ideas of what it means to me to be happy and healthy, and all of those things that go into um, just the thought process that I have around life and li living and the, the, the lessons learned there. That is all long form content. I spend some time thinking, writing basically essays and journaling, and that type of content I create podcasts out of. And so that's where I get to use the podcast as a platform to dive into all of these intellectual curiosities that that right. I have and, and really flesh out those ideas very deeply. The YouTube channel is going to be primarily where I have 
just the ability to explore interests and passions. And so I'm passionate about like learning, adventures, having fun, some dog stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But in that longer, maybe five to 25 minute format, I can take videos of the vacations I go on or the different diet experiments that I'm doing or whether I'm building a, a bat house or um, just random things I'm doing without my, throughout my life, I can document that kind of long form, explore those passions and interests and make a YouTube video out of it. And then on this other end of the spectrum, we have you know what I'll just call shorts. And so that's TikTok, Instagram reels, YouTube shorts, Facebook reels, this whole kind of TikTok short video phenomenon that really has grown in the last two years. That's primarily um, focused on dog relating co- dog related content. One because since I was a professional dog trainer, I just have a lot of advice to give there. Um, I also have three dogs, which make it really easy to record yeah. compelling content with. Um, and in general, those videos just tend to do a little bit better than some of the other types of content I'll do short form. Um, so, you know, shorts, short form videos is primarily dog training, dog advice, dog related content, some virality. Um, but I also make sure to, to kind of try to throw some other stuff I'm interested in into the shorts as well, such as, you know, podcast snippets, um, a little bit of lessons and the occasional cooking video or two. Which I enjoy as well. Learned a couple of things there. Um, so I think everyone could probably agree that you have a good balance of um, interest in trying new things, but also consistency with the things that you enjoy doing. Um, Mm. Let's take a step, kind of a a little step back here. Um, Who in your life has influenced you the most and maybe led you to be the type of person that you are where you just like to jump into things? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, a great question. And there are definitely a few different answers that I could probably go with depending on kind of the mood and and who I'm taking inspiration from. So, you know, I think the first answer that I have is going to be my dad. And that's going to be someone that I think I've taken a lot of inspiration from without even really realizing I'm taking inspiration from him. Um, so, you know, I, I have a great relationship with my dad. I love him. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, so he is, you know, he, he owns his own business. It's just a one person business. So, you know, he doesn't have a bunch of employees, but he owns his own business where he makes himself, you know, good money, but lives a a comfortable lifestyle where he basically has everything he wants and needs financially but then has a lot of time and energy to devote to the things that he loves doing, such as, you know, doing projects around his house or playing tennis and golf or spending time with family and friends. Um, And that kind of spirit of doing what is necessary for work and finding a way to be financially comfortable or financially successful while also pursuing the flexibility and the ability to really have a a fulfilling and happy and healthy life, I think I've kind of subconsciously modeled what I want out of life from that. Um, It's never been something that I, you know, look at my dad and it's like, I want to be exactly like that. But I think I'm very lucky that, you know, my father is someone I can look up to as someone who's kind of you know, sought their own path um, and has really made it work. So my dad is a huge influence on me in that way and super, super thankful, blessed and grateful for that. Um, I'd say, you know, more so in the last few years, I I mentioned I kind of discovered podcasts um, over 2019, 2020, later than I wished. Um, But I really have a high level of respect for Tim Ferriss and his podcast, The Tim Ferriss Show. And that's going to be a lot of where I take inspiration from for trying out different types of passions and interests and self-experiments 
And it's really just a dive into how can you craft and live a happy, healthy, um, you know, there's a few categories I think he has in one of his books, but it's, it's healthy, wealthy, and wise. So mm-hmm. how can you learn about health and wellness and live a healthy lifestyle? How can you also, you know, create financial liberty and freedom for yourself and be financially comfortable? But then also, how can you be wise? And like, what are the lessons you can learn along the way to improve your own life, but then spread those lessons to the lives around you? And Tim does that through his own self-experiments, his own books, but also interviewing some of the, the most famous and successful people in the world from you know, Mark Zuckerberg and the CEOs of these large companies to Buddhist monks, to UFC fighters, to famous actors and musicians, to people that you've never even heard of. And so I really am inspired by his kind of intellectual pursuits and curiosity and the the fact and the idea that you can learn so much from other people if you're just willing to ask questions and listen. Love that. That's awesome. Um, Tim Fer- Tim Ferriss show is fantastic. Uh, he's got some great episodes on there. I've listened to pinpoint once, especially that you've told me to listen to and it never disappoints. Mm. Um, so I wanted to change the category a little bit. Um, so you have known the game of golf for your whole life, but recently have taken a bigger interest in it. So mm. as someone who's kind of picking it up and with your personality where you like to take things and really study them and get into it. What's your strategy on getting better at golf and how are you going to, how are you going to get to the pros? Oh man. (laughs) Oh, as far as golf, man, I just close my eyes swing and hope that it goes where I want it. So uh, (laughs) uh, the old, the old Irish luck is injected into the golf game. Um, No. So, um, you know, I was thinking about this actually before we had, this conversation and I am utterly addicted to the learning curve. And what I mean by that is the journey from being incompetent in something to competence or incompetence to proficiency, sucking at something and then getting to a point where you're good at it is the most addicting thing in the world to me. Mm. I love the process of learning, especially when what you're learning, the results are viewable and tangible. And golf is a currently for me a super great example of that. Because, you know, a few months ago, um, I kind of started playing a little bit. Uh, I've played a couple times over in the last 23 years. Uh, but then really about six months ago, I, I started, you know, I, I bought a couple clubs um, and went out and played a few rounds and, um, you know, I sucked. So <laughs> I would, I would try to swing and I would just, just strike the dirt. It would be like I was digging holes on the golf course Um, you know, I, I would shoot so bad that I couldn't even count the score. I I would, I would show up to the golf course with 20 golf balls and leave with five. And those five are the ones I found in the bushes. So (laughs) like just horrible at it. Um, but the fun thing is, is every time you, you play with golf, um, you know, if you have some focus and some strategy and some tactics, it's the type of thing where you can see yourself getting better almost every time. Um, so basically my, my process for that is, is first getting a starting point. So, you know, that first round I go out, I chunk it, I miss it. And it's also bad that I'm just like, man, I, I know nothing about this. There are some activities where you can go out, let's call it ping pong, where you can kind of, pick up a ping pong paddle and and hit it a little bit and be playing the game of ping pong golf for me, not like that. Like I was utterly hopeless. So my process, I'm a visual and an auditory learner, um, as well as a kinesthetic learner. I, you know, go to YouTube and I type in how to, you know, what are the basics of golf? And, you know, some of the first things I, I did was just learn some basic golf etiquette. 
um, because I knew I was going to go out and I might not be great at swinging the golf club, but you know, at least I could, I could look like I know what I'm doing and adhere to the course rules. So Mm -hmm. no, not to, uh, you know, yell at people while they're hitting their driver off the tee. (laughs) Um, and know that, you know, after you hit the dirt and you have dirt all over your club, you should probably clean it off and that's going to help. And so learning some of those, there, there's a whole bunch of learnings that people just don't even like realize are learnings that can get you a pretty solid way or like a fair amount of the way. So golf etiquette was a, a first thing, but then, you know, fundamentals of a golf swing. So how far apart should your feet stand? Uh, how can, or should you hold a club or what even does a proper golf swing kind of look like? And these things are kind of difficult to learn, but you can through watching for me, watching a handful of videos, get these basics and then apply that yourself. And so one of the best ways to do that is, is to practice. So I've got, you know, a sack of, little rubber balls. And I will literally take those into the backyard and hit practice balls in my own backyard. And I'll practice and I'll take a video of myself and I'll watch it and I'll compare, Hey, this is what my swing looks like on my phone. And here's what the professionals are doing. And I'm not a pro, but I can at least see like, Hey, my stance, I'm standing with my feet too close together or my backswing, you know, my, my arms are bent. I need to straighten them out. So, um, through that type of iterative process can start to really improve quite quickly. Um, and then through practice and that type of iteration can start to find myself, you know, moving up the learning curve. And then each time I go out and play golf, it's just a smidge better than the last. And so, I'm right there in the heart of that learning curve where each time I'm playing, it's just a little bit better. And, um, that's so addicting to me. I know there's going to be a point to where I like hit diminishing returns and I've gotten to where I would call myself like an adequate golf player at that point. It's probably going to take tons of work to, to improve from there. So I will not be on the tour anytime soon, but (laughs) maybe one day. And I think we recently both learned when we pulled out the putting green that your girlfriend, Emily, is actually the best putter out of all of us, to our surprise. So, Oh, yeah. I still owe her some money. No. Oh. Um, <laughs> so obviously YouTube, you mentioned learning on YouTube is so important. So there's kind, mm-hmm. of, there's kind of a couple things that we talk about uh, when it comes to the younger generations. One, kids are on their tablets too much. Two, you can learn anything on the internet ever. So our kids going to be smarter than adults are now or dumber because of the technology use that they're going through? Mm, man, that's, I really like that question. Um, it's actually something, you know, I haven't thought about it now, but now I'm just, I'm going to take a moment with that. <laughs> um, okay. First answer. So kids are going to have access to more information kids are going to have access to basically all the information. Right. And so there is the potential for people in newer generations to be way more knowledgeable, have access to way more tools and be able to implement things that some of the past generations, probably ourselves included, couldn't even dream of. Now, the idea, all because there's access to that information doesn't mean you have the tools and the abilities to apply that. And so what we need to make sure as a generation and as people that are creating technologies, we need to make sure that we don't just increase the access to information, but also increase our abilities to take information, digest it in a useful way, and then do something with that. And so I think we're already seeing a little bit of a gap start to form now because we do at this current point have access to basically all the information in the world. And I think you'll start to see some gaps where even though we have all this information right at our fingertips, it's overwhelming and we're not used to processing and having access like this in order to apply it to life. And so if you go back to our golf example, we can say, Hey, 
anyone out there can watch all those same free videos that I do, mm-hmm. yet we're still going to have golfers that don't care enough to do it. Right. We're still going to have people that go out and play golf for the first time and aren't going to look up a tutorial. We're going to have those people that might be have played golf for a few years and think that you know, reading a book is the best way for them to learn about their golf swing. And, you know, it might be, um, the, the point is, is that the younger generation and even our generation needs to learn the skills to search for the information that's useful, figure out what is useful, and then figure out how they can apply that into their own lives and the world around them. And so it's going to be transitioning more from in the past, the big question was gathering information. Now we have it. It's all at our fingertips. Yeah. Now it's all about how do you apply that information? And I think we're going to see some types of gaps where some people are going to be really excellent at applying information that they learn. And I think we've kind of seen that in the, you know, the tech boom space where people that can learn how to code and create technical advancements have really quickly become rich and influential, et cetera, because they've been able to harness the ability of the internet to learn something new and apply it. Right. Um, and yeah, I think that's going to be the big question. So education is going to be more, I feel like, effective when it teaches how to apply information and tools rather than how to, you know, gather that information. But great question. That honestly is, a, I, I'll be thinking about that one later for sure. <laughs> it, there may not be one answer, you know, and time will tell, but as a father mm-hmm. of, of kids who love their devices, I can say that they do have a keen sense of, of vocabulary advancements, I think compared to maybe what we had when we were younger amongst many other things. Um, Mm-hmm. but also find themselves, you know, laying around where back in the day we may have been playing outside. So there, there is kind of yeah. a balance there. Yeah. Um, so speaking of education, YouTube is a great teacher. You were a student at the Sam Walton School of Business here in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Do you um, appreciate your time at a prestigious business school? And do you think that it was valuable for your life and where you're at now? Yeah. Yeah, another good question. Um, so I think the the short answer is, um, you know, I'm I'm the person I am today because of the past experiences I I've gone through. And going to college, the Walton College specifically, is one of those experiences that I had and I learned from. Um, now, with that being said, you know, I don't know what I would have been without having gone to that college. And it's very possible and, and uh, very well could have been that I might have been more successful without it, or maybe I would have been a complete bum without <laughs> it. Um, you know, I think the, the, the true answer is probably somewhere in the middle. And the college experience at Walton College, I, I definitely learned a lot of good lessons Um, but there definitely, there was definitely nothing that was, uh, you know, I could have lived with my life without, um, you know, I think any other business school would have taught, you know, approximate lessons. I think the biggest things that I were learning was through my own kind of ventures on the side. So in college, I, I created my dog training business. It wasn't because I necessarily learned about accounting and learned about marketing and learned about management and college, it it was because I had the motivation to start training dogs on the side. Um, So I think those lessons about business all can be learned through life and living. And the Walton College definitely was a great place to learn some of those basics. Um, But, you know, it also, I think one of the best things about it was that it gave me space in life. It gave a three to four year period where I had some time to just absorb the world around me and become an adult without really having to worry about my career at that point. And so, you know, would I go back? I I would. Um, Do I think it was just the most instrumental thing in my life? I, I don't believe so. 
there were, I will call out two specific classes that really, I think, changed the trajectory of my life during the Walton College. And they both happened in my senior year. One was a program called Forever Red or SAKE. And SAKE was an acronym. It, 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 was, it stood for Students Acquire Knowledge Through Enterprise. And basically, it was this class, a small group of kids who get recruited and basically hired um, each year to run a completely student-run business called Forever Red. Um, and you got class credits, and you and a group of uh, between like 11 and 18 students are just running this business for your class credit. And it's completely applied um, you know, the grades are based off of essentially revenue and how you're doing in this business. And so Forever Ed, we had a handful of products. You have a two semester tenure. The first semester, you're basically an associate there. And then the second semester, a handful of people are chosen to be the managers, the, the decision makers, the leaders that are running that business. So the first semester, we only sold um, this product that was... Um, Oh, uh, diploma frames, as well as rubbings of the student walk. So if you go to U of A, you know, in the sidewalk, when you graduate, you get your name etched in the sidewalk. Yeah. And so we would get this gold crayon and a piece of paper and go rub and etch the names there and uh, print that out. And, and, you know, is a student rubbing. And so that was the business. And for years, Forever Red was just, you know, doing diploma frames and things like that. And it was a real business, you know, um, selling it to real people, real customers. And, uh, you know, it worked well. Um, that was my first semester. In the second semester, I was lucky enough to be in the position where I can't became, you know, kind of the CEO figure of that business. Um, and we actually split it out. It was the first time I think we made enough revenue to split that Forever Red business into really two classes and two main departments in which I was kind of the, the CEO figure of. And we had what was called Venture Sake, which I was the, the leader of, and then you know Traditional Sake. And so the traditional part of the business was still focused on those diploma frames and rubbings and the things that that business did in the past, while the Venture Sake, which I led, was all about innovation and new product development and trying to grow that business in an exciting new way. And so during that tenure, one, I, I learned a handful of things. One, I, I managed a team that had, you know, like 11 people on it across a few different functions, such as commercialization, marketing, customer service, accounting. Um, two, figured out the whole process for operating, getting sales and creating new products. So we created, let me just grab it real quick. Yeah. Back here. So this was our little creation for the camera. Uh, it is called the hog hologram and it's out of battery, but it, it's this little razor back hologram, a desk light. And it glows and it's the simplest little idea, but you know, while we were there, we're like, Hey, let's get another product that's different than a diploma. And so created this product and ordered the, you know, placed the orders, talked with manufacturers in China, placed those orders, and then went into stores with it and said, Hey, we've got this Razorback. We've got this hog. It is awesome. People love it how about you buy 50 of them from us and sell it to people? And so, you know, learn those sales as, as well as we did, um, you know, a student care package box um, that we sold to people uh, during orientation. And so I uh, went and uh, managed to get into the Walton College orientation. And every single day during a summer, I would uh, take my lunch break from the internship I had at Field Agent, run down to the college sit quietly in this presentation in front of, you know, a, a crowd of 200 plus parents. Yeah. And then the, the Dean would give me a nod and I'd, I'd come up and I'd sell the student care package in front of an auditorium every day awesome. and, you know, managed to get something like $9,000 worth of sales over the course yeah. of, you know, 30 days presenting at the auditorium. So 
all of that was just so real and hands-on and you know it was the first time i i really got to see how a team of people and business can be done and operated so that was i will say super super transformative that's awesome yeah yeah wow i love that so i mean because i'm i'm getting i'm inspired by this right it's very cool Mm -hmm. um similar somewhat to part of my story just jumping into different business things and then learning and growing um and uh what do you what do you say to someone who wants to start something maybe they have a hobby that they enjoy or maybe um they just have an interest that they've never jumped Mm -hmm. into What what do you say to someone who needs to um kind of just dive in you know yeah yeah there there's a few things that are kind of popping to my mind the the first is that it's better to start and fail than to never start at all and that was really the thought that ended up getting me to start my own dog training business I was a senior in high school and or sorry not high school senior in college uh, going into the last semester and trying to figure out what do I want to do with my life and you know luckily I, I had great grades in the Walton College you know I had an internship I had all of the things I needed to go into the corporate world and and you know make a living for myself and go down that path and and be a great corporate worker and you know I kind of am still that, Um, but I, I wanted to do something different and I didn't know what, and I had started this kind of dog training journey a little bit. And I remember thinking to myself whether or not I wanted to commit to it. And the thought that I finally had that, that lit my fire was that I would so much rather try this out and have it fail than never try at all. And I know that if I looked back, I would have always imagined what could have been if I didn't do that dog training business. And the other thing to that, the other side of that coin is that nothing is permanent. And so I did go down that path of dog training and, you know, it has evolved and it changed, but like you don't have to stay with it. Any decision you make isn't necessarily permanent. And so I think a lot of people, when thinking about entrepreneurship, thinking about their new ventures, imagine everything as a permanent decision. And it really isn't that. Um, It's something that you can make and that you can go down that path. And if you learn that it's something you don't want to follow through with, you don't have to follow through with it. You can pivot. And so I think we assign a lot of false permanence to our decisions when really we should be thinking of things more as experiments. And that dog training business was an experiment that worked really well. And, you know, the thought of I even if even if this fails, I'll be in a better place because of it. Um, But I would rather try it and it fail than than not try at all. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, Things aren't permanent. Don't be afraid to fail because failures are where you're learning. Um, and it's probably better to try something out than to never try it at all. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing there is don't be afraid to start small. Um, you know, I think a lot of people also have this idea about entrepreneurship that everything has to be figured out up front. Like, you have to have this business plan. You have to know where the money's coming from. You have to quit your job and go all in and everything has to be, you know, in place up front. And uh, that's just not how entrepreneurship works. And I think it's how a lot of people think it works, but there's so many ways to begin small, taking small steps towards that goal that aren't overwhelming or committing. And so I'll, I'll go back to the dog training example. You know, whenever I decided, hey, I want to actually do this, the first thing I didn't do was drop out of college. The first thing I did was start researching, how do I create an LLC? What is an LLC? Like, 
what are the dog training businesses in my area? And what does it you know, look like to build a website? What are some of the popular website builders? And there's so many things that you can do. And I, I remember I had this Excel file, which was basically my action log, where I wrote down 30 days in a month in an Excel file. And I set this up myself a goal um, that I'm going to do five minutes of work towards this dog training business each day. Nice. And five minutes of work could have been one Google search. It could be one video of me learning how to teach someone to teach their dog to sit. Um, you know, it can be anything. But as long as I took five minutes a day and did as much as a Google search, that is getting you towards the place of starting a business that you want to start. And so you can start so much smaller. And, you know, lots of times what you'll find, if it is something you actually enjoy, that five minutes can turn into 15, that 15 can turn into 30, that 30 minutes can turn into an hour. And you might find yourself, if you're really motivated by it, spending multiple hours working on this business. And, and that's, I think, how you start to understand that this is something you should pursue. If you set yourself a goal and I'm going to work on this business five minutes a day, at the end of the month, you hate it every time. Well, maybe it's not the best path for you. And that's totally fine. So that's the advice. One, don't be afraid to start small. Two, nothing's permanent. Three, you're likely going to feel better about trying and failing than never trying at all. And uh, there's maybe a fourth one in there. I forgot it, but that's 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 <laughs> what I'm going with so far. Awesome, man. So we're almost about to wrap this up, but I just wanted to do one thing a little bit more of a get to know you. Can you can you rapid answer some questions? Just very simple questions. Yeah. All right. You ready? Yep. Favorite alcoholic drink? Oh, old fashioned. Old fashioned. Favorite restaurant? Yep. Hmm. That shouldn't be so hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to go with, it, it probably changes based on my mood, but I'm going to go with Sushi House in Bentonville, Arkansas. Great answer. Um, favorite food to cook? Favorite food to cook. Um, I think the most consistent for me has been curry. I love curry. Love cooking curry. Nice. Um, favorite golf club to use out of the bag? The favorite golf club. Oh, man. This this kind of depends on the day. Um, you know, it's, it's a love-hate relationship with the club sometimes. I think my pitching wedge is probably my favorite. That's my best. Favorite TV show? TV show. South Park. Okay. And then growing up, what was your favorite video game to play? Ah, uh, yeah. So fun little story here if I might divulge. Go for um, it. My favorite game growing up for sure was Call of Duty. Um, and for... The listeners out there, I actually was on track to becoming a professional Call of Duty player in high school. And uh, yeah, me and me and some of my buddies, um, you know, we were kind of like the nerds in high school. So, uh, you know, we uh, we played sports and stuff. I was on the tennis team, et cetera. Um, but most of my Friday nights and Saturday nights, instead of out, you know, going partying and things like that, I was playing a lot of video games. And so I played competitive Call of Duty um, and even got to the point where I was winning some tournaments and actually making a little bit of money. And uh, I, for a little while, thought that I might not go to college and just be a professional Call of Duty player. And uh, that uh, didn't end up going through, but Call of Duty is my favorite some great times, great memories, and you know, maybe the life would have looked a lot different if I stuck to to that <laughs> path. I, I might, I probably would be a whole lot more richer if I would yeah, start right. that. Honestly, right, right. You're yeah. just taking a different path. So, yeah. <laughs> well, man, this has been fun. That's all I got for you. So, thanks for doing this um, Real with Ryan podcast. If you're listening from one of my channels or platforms, that's where you need to check it out. YouTube, you can listen in on the podcast. Um, Ryan can tell you more details on that. And then we may even include Ryan's uh, Instagram handle as well um, in this. So Ryan, thanks for being on, man. 
Yeah. Thank you so much, Pat. Great questions. You'll, you definitely have me thinking, um, some good stuff today. I might even come up and, and create another podcast just uh, with some better answers to some of the questions for sure. <laughs> Love it, man. Thanks again. Have a good one.